So uh, there's a tremendous um, um, amount of excitement about the possibility of building a completely new class of quantum hardware for which the degree of difficulty of different uh, data processing problems can be not the same as for uh, classical hardware. And uh, so I'm going to try to tell you about some of that, some of the um, rough idea of the theory, and a little bit about some of the experiments. Um, so let's start. We're really in the midst of a second quantum revolution, so let's start with the first quantum revolution, which started more than 100 years ago with people doing completely useless, curiosity-driven research with no possible applications that led to, however, a few things like the transistor, the laser, the atomic clock, and the global positioning system. And the people that were, the academics that were doing this useless, uh, strange research to understand inconsistencies in physics just did not foresee the invention of these quantum devices. The people that invented these quantum devices did not see all their app foresee all their applications. And I think that will be true for the quantum computer. We have some idea. The people that invented the laser were just trying to do precision spectroscopy on atoms, and they weren't thinking about transmitting music. Um, and I think uh, we're in the same boat with quantum computers. And the thing I want to take you to take away from this talk is that these amazing quantum devices are not fully quantum mechanical. They do not take full advantage of the power that quantum machines uh, can have. And that's that new understanding is what's leading to this second quantum revolution. So, for example, with the 20th century technology, the atomic clock, 1953, uh, very soon, uh, not, you know, in, in some decades, but uh, uh, led to the global positioning system, satellites in space. You can hold an object in your hand, uh, like this one, and uh, it can tell you the time to within a couple of nanoseconds and tell you where you are on Earth to within a couple of meters. The people uh, that invented the laser were mostly thinking about death rays or something, but uh, we now use it to play music and transmit information at stupendous bandwidths uh, over tremendous distances through glass fibers. The transistor was invented in 1947. Uh, here it is. It's ugly. It's about an inch across. It sort of worked uh, and looked like it might eventually work well enough to replace the vacuum tube. It turns out it did. Uh, it led to integrated circuits and uh, just uh, this scaling down in size and in price um, has led to a tremendous rate of production of transistors in the world today. Anybody want to guess how many transistors are produced? What rate they're being produced at? Twenty trillion per second. That's a lot. It's a good thing that they're cheaper than the one dollar I paid for the Raytheon CK722 experimenters transistor in 1960. So the price has come down uh, considerably. So the initial uses of computers were for things like artillery tables. How much does air friction affect the uh, motion of uh, shells? Uh, then eventually to cryptography, to the design of nuclear weapons and missile guidance. But the myriad of uses that are appeared today would just, uh, I suspect, would be a surprise to the people who were doing these early uh, things. And again, we don't know where quantum computers are going, but we're hoping for similar surprises. So the second quantum revolution began in the 1980s and 90s with a new understanding of the information content of quantum systems and the fact that they could process, store, 
encrypt, uh, uh, communicate information in ways that have no classical counterpart. And we're still trying to understand what the potential applications are. We know that one good use is for uh, solving the equations of quantum mechanics itself, sort of seems natural. Uh, we know certain uh, cryptography applications, both for breaking codes and for making unbreakable codes. In the end, in the balance between offense and defense, privacy actually wins out, it turns out. And, uh, and people are think you know, it's a fact that we don't fully understand whether algorithms exist to, uh, that would allow quantum hardware to solve certain classes of problems better. And that's still an open research topic. So um, this second quantum revolution is based, as I've just said, on a, on a completely new way to store and process information. Uh, it uses the concept of quantum superposition that bits, instead of being either zero or one in some extremely crude se sense, which upsets the experts, but you just have to simplify things and say, can be both zero and one at the same time, that uh, the fact that you're uncertain which it is is actually a feature rather than a bug. There's this concept of entanglement which I am going to mention today, but next Wednesday's talk by my friend Alain Espey is entirely devoted to what is entanglement, and I urge you to go and hear his uh, spectacular uh, talk on the subject. Entanglement is a kind of superposition state for more than one qubit, and uh, the entangled states have very strange properties that qubits in different parts of the computer or in the network of computers can be correlated with each other in ways that are stronger than possible classically. And these extra correlations permit some strange things such as teleportation in this, you know, not quite at the Star Trek level, but teleportation of qu unknown quantum states or carrying out a gate operation. I want to do an, a not operation on some qubit over there. If I have pre, if if the two modules are sharing some entangled qubits, I can do something over here and get the result uh, teleported over to the other side. It's pretty amazing. Um, so. Um, the, the question of whether if I do something here, it instantaneously happens over there uh, is a fraught one, and you'll hear about it uh, next week. Uh, the answer is nothing useful happens instantaneously. You still need classical communication below the speed of light uh, to make use of this. But you can, in some sense, pre-position an entangled pair like this and be able to send a message through it even though you separated the two halves before you decided what message you're gonna send. That's called quantum dense coding. I could give a whole talk on that. Um, so this combination of effects leads to a kind of massive parallelism that I'll talk about more, that you can do many calculations at once in parallel and perform computations that would be impossible on any conventional computer of any conceivable size. And it's not because of clock speed. The clock speed on current quantum computers is typically slower than on uh, highly developed uh, high performance computers. It's because the complexity of tasks can scale differently with size on a quantum computer than on a classical computer. Okay, so the real irony is Einstein hated this. He said quantum mechanics has to be wrong. It's too spooky and weird. It just, it's counterintuitive. It doesn't make any sense. Definitely it's wrong. And the irony is we do these tests every day as an engineering test to make sure that by doing the things that Einstein said were impossible, our quantum computer is working as a quantum computer and is not classical. So that's kind of a... Good way to start your morning. So 
What kind of powers do quantum machines have? As I said, this is still an open research topic in quantum computer science. But we know there are certain problems that are classically easy. For example, I can multiply two numbers quickly on my watch. But the reverse problem, finding the prime factors of some large problem, uh, is not um, provably uh, hard on a classical computer, but is uh, very strongly and very widely believed to be hard. But it has been proven to be easy on quantum hardware with the Shor factoring algorithm, which is what started a lot of the interest in this field. There are some problems, uh, despite the magic powers of quantum hardware, that are still hard. And this sort of there's this general notion that, oh, uh, quantum computers should be good at solving problems of quantum mechanics. That's true with some caveats, but there are definitely uh, problems you'd like to solve, finding the ground state of a complicated interacting pile of electrons in a big molecule is quantum hard, although quantum hardware will, will help you a lot. It's still technically hard. But if I give you a quantum state and say, how does it evolve in time, that's easy on a quantum computer. And hard, provably hard, exponentially harder on a classical computer. So there are some things that we know are exponentially easier, some things uh, we know aren't, some things we aren't sure. So, uh, and quantum computer science classification scheme is a little crude. Like they, theorists only say it's either exponentially better or not. It's like everything is an elephant or not an elephant. It, you, there's no uh, refinement there. If I could get a polynomial speed up, you know, n cubed and n was a billion, I'd be pretty happy with it. Um, so, and they're, all, they're good at proving worst case scenarios that a certain class of problems is definitely hard or contains hard instances. But there are lots of times where you can't find those hard instances. You can find things that get the right answer despite the fact that it's hard. So there's this kind of heuristics that uh, has, is well developed in the classical case. And we need it to develop in the... Um, in the quantum case, and it will as people as hardware is now becoming available, and people can young people can start hacking around and uh, figure out clever ways to do things. Okay, so I'll just take a little sideline here and talk about quantum machines and energy in two senses. One is energy consumption by a quantum computer. So it turns out that. Quantum computers are like frictionless machines. They have to be able to run forward and backward equally well. And if a quantum computer consumes any energy during the computation, it definitely failed. So that's kind of an interesting thought, given how much electricity is spent on uh, roughly 3% of, I think, US energy is spent on Google searches and uh, other kinds of computation. Uh, now, of course, uh, the laws of thermodynamics and information theory guarantee that uh, the refrigerator that I'm going to tell you about costs energy to cool your computer down. And actually initializing the computer, setting all the bits to zero, costs energy. Correcting errors costs energy because you have to get rid of entropy. And readout of the final state of the computer has to be done irreversibly so that you, you know, it settles on some definite state. All those cost energy, but extremely tiny amounts of energy compared to what a typical classical computer uh, consumes. So um, there's, a, there's another interesting connection to energy, which is that artificial fertilizer takes, consumes a huge amount of energy. And, um, and yet, legumes, when in the old days when people used to rotate their crops, they would plant legumes every third year. And there are bacteria in there, which under standard pressure, uh, temperature and pressure conditions, using this nitrogenase Fimoco factor, could fix nitrogen from the air and make, uh, uh, make its own, uh, put fertilizer, essentially, into the soil. And there's a... Uh, today, huge amounts of energy are spent uh, making artificial fertilizer. So I, uh, to my shock, I learned when researching this that 
That loaf, uh, those two bag three baguettes that I made last weekend have a carbon footprint of about 0.6 kilograms a piece. Th I didn't realize it was that large. 40% of the carbon footprint for a loaf of bread is the carbon dioxide that's emitted during this high pressure, high temperature process to make nitrogen fertilizer. It's very hard to make it happen to turn uh, nitrogen in the air into ammonia, which is the first step. It takes place at 200 atmospheres, 450 Celsius, and consumes about 1% of US total energy, not just electricity, and about 1% of our natural gas. So if you could figure out with a quantum computer how this molecule works or how to make a catalyst that's simpler than that, which could allow you to uh, fix nitrogen uh, at uh, lower energy costs, more efficiently, and lower temperature and lower pressure, you could have a tremendous impact, on economic impact on the world. Okay, so that's uh, kind of the big picture fun stuff. Let's, uh, everybody, I don't know, is it, I, uh, it's difficult. We have a mi we're in mixed company here. There are experts and non-experts, so I'm going to insult you by reminding you about classical bits for a moment. Uh, apologies if you know all this stuff, but it's an an, uh, you know, it's a one or a zero. It's an answer to a true, false, or yes, no question. And it's sort of the smallest natural unit of information. And information is physical. Information is stored in and transmitted by physical systems. There's a sort of abstract concept of what information is. But if you're going to use it, it always involves some physical system. So for example, a transistor on or off, or a classical switch in a zero, uh, when it's open, we could call that zero. When it's a one, it, the circuit's on and the uh, current is flowing, and your friends far away can read the value of the bit because they see the light bulb. Now, that's sort of straightforward. But just to remind you, there are only two possible encodings for classical bits. Either switch open is a zero or switch open is a one. Those are the only two choices. As a result of that, there's only one kind of error, that you're using the wrong encoding or that a bit flipped from one to zero or zero to one. That's the only kind of error. Classical errors, classical bits are more subtle. Classical errors are going to be continuous it's going to be a much more complicated and nuanced story. So quantum bits, still information is physical, but now the quantum information is stored not in the state of some macroscopic transistor or mechanical switch. Uh, it's stored in the quantum states of atoms, molecules, photons, superconducting circuits, the, the quantized mechanical vibrations, um, all kinds of things like that. There are many different technologies being pursued to hold quantum information and build computers. And the thing about quantum systems is that their energy levels are discretely quantized, uh, like the, you know, the Bohr orbits of a hydrogen atom. Uh, and you can take the lowest two and call the lowest energy level zero and the upper energy level one. And if you measure the energy of your system, it's always either zero or one. So a classical, a quantum bit is like a classical bit in the sense that when you measure it, you always get one bit of classical information. Zero or a one. Now, there's some notation that I'm going to put up here because I keep using in different versions of it throughout the talk. So Computer scientists will say the states are zero and one. A physicist might say gr G and E, ground and excited. And a person doing nuclear magnetic resonance, of which I know there's at least one in the audience, uh, will say that there's a spin vector, which is down or up. And uh, in sometimes instead of saying zero and one, we'll say there's a, a Z component of this spin, and it's plus one or minus one. So I, I will switch around among these notations. Uh, during the talk, so I try to make sure they're clear here. So the superposition principle that you can be in a superposition of down and up, or zero and one, 
is, uh, is shown here that the, uh, there's some quantum amplitude that's defined by two numbers that you can think of as the latitude and longitude of a unit vector on this sphere called the block sphere. And you can think of that unit vector as the spin polarization if you're an NMR person. And uh, the North Pole is up, or Z is 1, and the South Pole is spin down, or Z is minus 1, or 1 and 0, as you prefer. And uh, so there's a continuum of states intermediate between uh, uh, 0 and 1, or up and down. And so you can see that um, errors are going to be continuous. You could prepare this state, and then some noise could just sort of continuously deflect you away from there. So there's an analog character to quantum information. It's labeled by uh, two real numbers that describe the analog state of the bit. And yet, when you measure the bit, you always just get the 0 or 1, or z is plus 1 or minus 1. So a way to think about the difference is that, indeed, quantum bits are like classical bits in that you get a discrete result when you measure them. But instead of having only two possible encodings, that this is 1 or that's 1, there are an infinite number of encodings. You can turn what the physicists call the quantization axis arbitrarily. And that's the analog aspect of it. So if Alice prepares a bit in what she calls z equals plus 1, it's on the North Pole, and Bob chooses a different quantization axis, when Alice hands him the bit, he will measure uh, a... Uh, uh, he will... This will turn out to be a superposition state in his basis. And he will uh, measure z prime is plus 1 with a probability that's the square of this amplitude related to this angle. And he'll measure z prime is minus 1 with a sine squared of that half angle. So what's weird about this, first off, it's random. Randomness has suddenly appeared in ineluctable true randomness, not some pseudo-random number generator. And there's back action, or state collapse. If Bob measures that the state is this, then it is that. It's not this anymore. It has changed. But Bob doesn't have any way of knowing that. This change is invisible. If he measures it again, he confirms his result. The first measurement may have some randomness in it, but uh, it's the same every time after he measures it. So he has no way of knowing whether Alice sent him this state or this tilted state. And you might ask, why does randomness enter quantum mechanics? And if you think about it for a second, if it's true that every time I measure a quantum bit, I get a discrete answer. Z is 1 or minus 1 or the bit is 0 and 1. I get a discrete answer. So it's like a classical bit. And yet, there has to be some kind of continuity. If I make this angle very small so the encodings are almost the same, just by continuity, Bob should see almost Alice's result every time. And then continuously, it should change as he moves away. And eventually, he should, when he turns his axis 180 degrees, he will see exactly the opposite of what Alice has. So uh, that should change continuously. But you can't change 1 to minus 1 continuously. So the only way that this can be true is if there's some randomness enters. And it's the probability distribution which changes continuously from uh, you're 100% up over here, you'll get 50% up. Over here, you'll get 0% up. The probability distribution changes randomly, but the results are discrete. Uh, changes continuously, but the results are discrete. So this leads to the, a beautiful sentence by my friend Sasha Karatkov, who explains this back action. In quantum mechanics, you don't see what you get. You get what you see. <laughs> 
So it's not that before you measured something, it had a value. That is not true. You can do an experiment to prove that is not true. The randomness that bothered Einstein is built in. And it, it's not that it's secretly there's some variable that we can't measure that's determining the value of the thing ahead of time we're going to measure. It does not have a value. And the act of seeing, the act of looking, pulls into existence the value of the thing that you see. You, you get what you see. You don't see what you get. So this business of superposition uh, seems like a bug. I mean, that you're uns why would I build a computer in which I'm uncertain which state my bits are in? And when I measure, I get a random result. That's, why should I do that? That's crazy. If I prepare a superposition on the equator of the block sphere and I make a Z measurement, like Alice makes a Z measurement, she'll always find out that Z is minus one or plus one, and it'll just come out randomly. It's completely unpredictable. Now that true randomness is actually a useful resource for certain encryption purposes and other things. Um, and, uh, but, you know, in terms of like getting results out of a calculation, it seems like a bad thing. On the other hand, it's a kind of feature if uh, there is a sense in which the superposition is a, is a combination of z is plus one and z is minus one that the computer can act on at the same time. So let's explore that a little bit if I had a big... Um, register of bits. So a classical register of n bits can be in one of two to the n states. So here's a three-bit register, and you can see the states represent the binary numbers running from zero to seven. So there are eight states, two to the three. A quantum register can hold an exponentially large superposition of all possible of the two to the n states. Uh, here's an example shown here with uh, quantum amplitudes that are uh, equal in magnitude but have different signs. They could also be complex. They could also have different magnitudes. But the key thing is that versions of this state with exponentially many terms in the superposition can be created in one time step. It's a not a complex process. So there's a, some power that you can do exponentially many things in one step. And so maybe uh, that is somehow where the power of the quantum computer lies. And even a small computer of 53 qubits, a number not chosen uh, by accident because 2 to the 53 is about a petabyte, it's also the size of the Google quantum supremacy apparatus that I'll talk about later. So to specify this superposition, when you have 53 qubits and get all of those signs, uh, takes about a petabyte. Then you do an operation on it, and 10 nanoseconds later, you need another petabyte to describe the state, and another, and another, and another. So it's very, very difficult to simulate such a... You don't need exponentially many qubits uh, before you run out of classical bits on giant computers to do the simulation of the same thing. Now what's cool about this as a feature is that in time step one, I can kind of create all these numbers. And one of them is the correct answer to my, the question I want to ask the quantum computer. It's in there, along with exponentially many wrong answers, right? And, uh, but it is in there. And uh, the bug is that when I make a measurement, these giant superposition collapses to one of the classical states. And it's you just get an almost completely random bit string. It's exponentially unlikely that you will get the answer you want. Uh, so we'll come back to that in a moment. But this is a, leads us into... Um, uh, this you've probably heard about this Google quantum supremacy claim from which caused a huge amount of hype uh, last October, and uh, there they just did a ran a kind of random computer program, just randomly made these superpositions and then made a measurement on 53 qubits. They built 54, but one of them didn't work. 
and uh, and then they ran a classical simulation of the equations of quantum mechanics to simulate that result. And if it had been completely random, it would have been trivial to simulate. But there were just small correlations in the data. It's a very subtle, slight deviation from perfect randomness, which is actually very, very expensive to simulate uh, classically. And they did all kinds of checks at scales with smaller numbers of qubits, like 30, where they could fully simulate their machine and reproduce the results. And then finally, they got out to a regime where they uh, could no longer simulate it uh, classically uh, and going to a, lo a number of the so-called depth of the quantum circuit, how many of these gates they applied. They, uh, they got into a regime where they claimed it would take 10,000 years uh, on a classical supercomputer to reproduce the results that took them, uh, I forget, a few minutes. Uh, IBM immediately put out a press release saying, wow, they, they had a program that could do it in a day. But I don't think that's the, the, um, the main point. Uh, of course, with uh, progress in classical computation, you might eventually uh, beat any given example. But this is an amazing engineering test of the ability to control a system that has a Hilbert space dimension, a state space dimension of 2 to the 53. Um, it was still very, very noisy and full of errors, so the, the fidelity of the uh, results that they had is uh, only about 2, 10 to the minus 3, uh, but still it was enough that to uh, beat the, uh, the classical computation. So basically it was an engineering test for, the, for Google to decide that they should invest uh, more money in this field. Okay, so how do we do something? I mean, it had no economic values, completely useless, just draw, flipping a coin in some subtle way. Uh, we need to figure out how, if I take this giant superposition, I can run a program on it and get out the right answer and not the wrong answer. So how do you do that? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, uh, use some metaphor. I'm just stuck with using some metaphors here. So uh, you know that waves can interfere, that, that uh, crests and troughs can add up to zero, or crests and crests can add up to something big. And these quantum amplitudes have certain wave-like properties. And what I want the quantum computer to do is provide some kind of wave-like destructive interference that kills off the amplitudes for the wrong answers, and constructive interference that builds up the amplitude for the right answer. And the square of that amplitude is the probability that you'll get that answer. So you can, the goal of the program is to weed out the wrong answers and make sure that when you measure the output, you get the right answer with high probability. It doesn't have to be certainty, but high probability. And so you've probably seen interference fringes from uh, lasers, different laser fields, uh, and the dark regions are where the waves cancel out, and the bright regions are where the waves add up. So you can think metaphorically of a quantum computer algorithm as a kind of programmable diffraction grading, that waves spread out from the input uh, bit values uh, all over the place, and this thing causes interference among all those waves, blocks some of them, lets others through, lets them interfere in such a way that a significant constructive interference happens on the correct uh, element of the register and very little weight on the incorrect register so that when you measure, you see the right answer. So the, the Shore factoring algorithm uh, works that way. The Grover search algorithm works that way, for example. Okay, so you are now all experts, I hope, on quantum computing. So I'm going to give you, being a professor, I have to give you a quiz. But don't panic. Uh, I'm going to give you the answers. So uh, is quantum information carried by waves or particles? Yes. 
Is quantum information analog or digital? Yes. Okay, so you all pass. All right, so now we have to move on from theory to the hardware. How do you actually build these things? And right now, they're built by hand by PhD physics uh, students and postdocs and faculty. Uh, but industry is beginning to try to uh, bring some uh, systems discipline to this uh, practice. So here you'll see there are many different technologies. One involves uh, using ions, charged atoms. Here is uh, Chris Monroe's company, IonQ, has built this device. And it will load. Here's a little animation. You see uh, there's a loading zone where you add an ion and then you zip it over here to the computing zone. You cool it off a little bit. You zip it back. You add another one. And when you reach 24, you stop. Then you do some things to cool. They've been jiggling around and vibrating. You've got to cool them down to the mechanical motion of their quantum ground state. And then, boom, now it's ready to start the computation. And the particular way that you do the computations here, I won't go into. There are many other technologies. Uh, all uh, This one has the advantage of, because it's real atoms, there's lots of coherence. Uh, but because it's atoms, it's very hard to collect more than about 24 or maybe 50. Uh, it's very hard to imagine scaling up to 500. It'll be a challenge. But they have lots of quantum coherence. They're very quantum mechanical. So they have e every technology has pluses and minuses. And the one I'm going to tell you about today is the one we work on at Yale is superconducting microwave electrical circuits. So the first electronic, as opposed to atomic or ionic uh, system, quantum processor was built at Yale in, in 2009. And uh, here it is. It's a literally two-bit processor. Costs a lot more than two bits. Uh, and uh, it's the, the architecture is called circuit QED, circuit quantum electrodynamics. It's artificial atoms, which I'll tell you about, made of superconductors, coupled to individual microwave photons. And the thing about this technology is that it's produced by the same lithographic process that Intel makes integrated circuits with, but with the semiconductors replaced by superconductors because, remember, the computer cannot consume any energy during the process, and superconductors sort of uh, allow frictionless current flow. And uh, the machines that are now, uh, there's a huge amount of excitement and competition among industry and startups uh, all the machines using this technology are direct scale-ups of this uh, first uh, little device. And if you had told me that, uh, you know, the <laughs> papers I've been co-author on over the last 15 years would cause uh, people to invest literally billions of dollars, I would have been pretty surprised. But they are. Here's uh, Daniel Sank. I taught him freshman physics uh, at Yale. Uh, he worked with Michelle Devere for a while. Uh, he's talking to the boss at uh, Alphabet, uh, making some tiny adjustment in their <laughs> quantum computer. Uh, here's uh, we m almost all of the IBM team are graduates from uh, our group. Here's Honey Pike, who put the first transmon qubit that I'll tell you about inside a 3D microwave cavity and set a coherence record. Uh, Chad Rigetti worked for my colleague Michelle Devere. Uh, has a big uh, startup company in Berkeley. Uh, my colleague Rob Sholkoff has a startup company using all the new ideas we've had since all of our grad students went off and started uh, these other, uh, other efforts. So there are lots and lots of interest in this right now. I suspect that like uh, AI, there will be winters at various points, but uh, if people are patient, I think the technology is going to be very interesting and the relatively near future. So how do, you, how do you build an artificial atom? What is this so-called transmon qubit? Well, it's, a, um, it's just a little antenna. It's about a millimeter in size. The two arms of the antenna are aluminum evaporated on sapphire. Sapphire is a very good insulator. Aluminum becomes a superconductor at low temperature. And you connect the two halves of the antenna with a Josephson tunnel junction. That's kind of the transistor of quantum computing. And a Josephson tunnel junction is just 
two pieces of aluminum with a, with a little layer, about 10 atoms thick, uh, uh, maybe, maybe 40 atoms thick of aluminum oxide. It's an insulator. Normally, electrical current can't go through insulators. That's why you insulate wires. But in a superconductor, the electrons act like waves, and waves, quantum mechanically, can tunnel through barriers and slot, pairs of electrons can slosh back and forth across the two antenna pads and therefore radiate microwave photons or absorb microwave photons. So the excitations of this qubit are charges frictionlessly sloshing back and forth across here. And you get quantized energy levels, but unlike in a real, real atom, uh, instead of having transition frequencies between the states uh, requiring uh, visible photons at uh, petahertz frequencies, these occur at microwave frequencies. And so you can also think of this as, an, as a kind of artificial atom with atomic number 10 to the 12, because there's 10 to the 12 electrons in there, and you think, oh, pff, boy, that's going to have a terrible spectrum. But in fact, because of the superconductivity, all the electrons kind of move together, and uh, the, the only thing that can happen is this collective motion, and you just get these very simple spectrum of an anharmonic oscillator. And it's simpler than hydrogen. There's no uh, fine structure and hyperfine structure, for those of you that know what that is. And the quality factor, how many oscillations it can make before it spontaneously fluoresces, and emits a photon and loses its energy is uh, tens of millions comparable to that of hydrogen. And it, you know, you saw those ions in the ion trap machine glowing because they had a laser shining on them and they were absorbing the laser light and then f spontaneously emitting it. These guys will do that too. And uh, we actually surround them by a superconducting cavity to keep reflecting that energy back to prevent them from decaying, which makes the lifetime a factor of a thousand longer. So the really nice thing about our atoms is we get to decide how big they are by engineering, and they're gigantic. They're a millimeter across. And so when several pairs of electrons are sloshing back and forth a millimeter, that's a stupendous uh, uh, current that is well matched to exciting or absorbing uh, microwaves. It's basically an atom with its own antenna attached. And if we need a bigger antenna, we just make it bigger. So that's what we call circuit QED, these artificial atoms talking to microwave photons. So a photon is just you know, a quantum of light. And microwaves are light, just very long wavelength. So why, why is it microwaves instead of optical? Well, because these atoms are so big, they talk to centimeters wavelength light instead of micron wavelength light. And why do we have to put them in very expensive refrigerators and cool them down very close to absolute zero? That's because the frequency of oscillation is 100,000 times lower than visible light. And Planck's constant times that frequency, that's the energy of the quanta of microwave radiation, microwave photons. And at 5 gigahertz, that corresponds to the energy you would see at a temperature of about a quarter of a degree above absolute zero. So we have to put our fridges at uh, uh, 200, so 10 times colder than that, so that the atom falls down into its ground state and stays there. If this were exposed to uh, a temperature of 4 Kelvin, it would be like us staring into the sun. There would just be massive amounts of black body radiation that would cause excitations up here and ruin, ruin everything. So the, uh, here's the electromagnetic spectrum that shows here's wavelengths of different sizes, radio waves, microwaves, uh, 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 x-rays are the s wavelengths the size of atoms. Atoms actually emit wavelengths down here, quite a bit bigger than their size in the, in the visible. Our superconducting qubits 
emit things with 100,000 times lower frequency, quanta with 100,000 times less energy. And so if you wanted to cool something up here at room temperature down uh, a little bit, you could buy a fridge for $750. If you want to buy a fridge that cools you down to 200th of a degree uh, above absolute zero, it costs you an extra three zeros on the fridge cost. If you want to buy a radio that can manipulate uh, low frequency radio waves, you know, 100 bucks will get you fancy stuff. If you want to manipulate gigahertz frequency microwaves with nanosecond time resolution, you have to pay another three zeros in the price tag. And this is actually, uh, there are ways now to make this cheaper as we scale this up. People are working on that. But if it weren't for the happy coincidence that these are cell phone frequencies, which causes interference, but uh, that's not a problem, it turns out. Uh, there's a lot of test equipment to support the economy in uh, cell phones and, and cellular uh, telephony. And so it would actually be much more expensive without that. OK, so let's go back now to um, uh, something interesting about these huge superposition states, the exponentially different states. It, the power, the, the information content, the power comes with a price, an Achilles heel, namely great sensitivity to noise, perturbations, dissipation, friction. And so what can happen is that the phase of the superposition, <laughs> that plus sign which says that the arrow on the block sphere is on the equator uh, near Greenwich, can suddenly become a minus sign, and it's now pointing over on the equator near Singapore. And then that, the, the state, the computer forgets the, the precise quantum state it was supposed to be in, and it becomes effectively classical after what's called the coherence time T2. So, but despite this sensitivity, we've made exponential progress in qubit coherence times over the last 20 years. So in 1998, Nakamura at NEC in Japan built the first superconducting qubit. It had an immeasurably small coherence time of perhaps a nanosecond. And we've made five or six orders of magnitude in, uh, in improvements uh, since then. Uh, many of them by my experimental colleagues at Yale and also by uh, Will Oliver at uh, MIT and other people. And uh, so this is really tremendous exponential uh, progress. It sort of stops here, uh, partly because it got good enough that we could start do, you know, building small computers and playing with them, and we stopped worrying about making the lifetimes longer, and partly because the people doing this are not material science experts. We've now brought in uh, collaborations with material science experts, and this is beginning to uh, shoot upward again. OK, so, um, but no matter how much progress you make increasing coherence uh, times, we have to contend with something that I modestly call Gervin's Law, which I have discovered, which is that there's no such thing as too much coherence. <laughs> If you can make it one second, then people will come and say, yes, but the f solving the fertilizer problem, i got to run the program for two seconds. It's always they want to run longer and longer. So in order to make that happen, we're going to need quantum error correction. W inevitably, as we build large-scale systems, they're made of many, many imperfect parts. And we have to find a way, just as in classical computers, to get nearly perfect results from an imperfect device by making it fault tolerant. So I will um, talk about the quantum error correction problem now. And in a nutshell, it's the following. I'm going to give you an unknown quantum state. I don't know what it is. It came out of the middle of the quantum computer in the middle of the calculation. And it might or might not have an error. If you look at it, it will change. It will randomly collapse onto whatever it is that you see. Changing the state, perhaps, and ruining the calculation. Your job, if it 
develops an error is please fix it. Well, <laughs> the fact that this is actually possible in principle and has now been done in practice is to me vastly more amazing and miraculous than the idea if I had perfect hardware I could do quantum computation itself. It's really uh, remarkable because we know that when I look for errors, I'm going to change the state. So how in the world do you solve this problem? Uh, so the way you do it is you make what's called a logical qubit. It has logical state 0 and logical state 1, and it can be in superpositions of those. But it's made up of n physical qubits, in this case 9 in this example. It's not always 9. And I need to hide the information in there. I need to encrypt it in such a way that neither I nor the environment who, that may accidentally make measurements can learn what the state of the information, the logical information is. So it has to be stored non-locally in an almost holographic sense, such that no single physical qubit knows what the state of the logical qubit is. Is. The information is stored in these weird non-classical entanglement correlations between different pairs or triples or quadruples of qubits. And if you look at any one of them, you don't know what the correlation is, so you don't learn anything about the logical state. So you may not be looking, but the environment is looking. Like this guy might spontaneously emit a photon, and you say, oh, the photon came from the lower left corner. Now I know that guy was in the excited state. Now it's definitely in the ground state. Did I learn anything? And But you can, with the way these codes are set up, you can make special multi-qubit measurements, special correlation measurements that will tell you about the errors without telling you about the state in which the errors occurred. It's a very subtle, uh, remarkable possibility. And there's associated with it a kind of miracle. Remember I told you errors are continuous. I could have a state, and then it could just slowly drift off like that because it's kind of analog. Those kind of errors would be uh, very, very hard to repair. But there's a miracle that when you perform these measurements, the quantum errors, which are analog, suddenly collapse into only a small number of discrete possibilities. It turns out uh, three, actually. Three Pali errors for the experts. And so in this case, state collapse is our friend because we didn't learn anything about the logical bit, so we didn't collapse it, but we collapsed the error. So for example, this uh, uh, one weird feature of error correction is this guy could be in a superposition of having an error and not having an error. If I measure and it doesn't have an error, then it doesn't have an error. It may have before, but the act of measuring decided that it wasn't there. Or I find an error, but it's a discrete error that the bit flipped or the, the phase flipped around the equator. Uh, and this discreteness allows you then to make the repair because you know exactly what it is. So you do that with a Maxwell demon, some sort of very clever device that's making, monitoring all the time these subtle... Uh, error syndrome measurements, the multi-qubit correlations to look for the errors and then corrects them and pumps the resulting entropy into some cold bath somewhere. <laughs> and every quantum error correction code starts with a big problem. I had some error rate for one qubit, but now I have n qubits and the error rate is now n times bigger. So the first thing that happens is I make to try to make the error rate better, I make it n times worse. I take a huge step backwards. The Maxwell demon then has to be so clever and so fast and so accurate and not introduce errors of its own that it can overcome this loss of a factor of n, in this case 9, and then go even further and finally make the lifetime not just reach the break-even point where it's the same as if I had just wa used one qubit, but it's now longer. Okay, And uh, interestingly, the demon is made of imperfect parts, so it seems pretty hopeless. But 
it turns out that in a fault tolerant system, the demon only makes errors of the kind which it can correct itself in the next round. And uh, you uh, actually can build a fault tolerant system. So uh, here's uh, an example of how it works. Here's the single physical qubit error rate. Here is the logical qubit error rate. If I just had one qubit, then those are the same thing. So there's a 45 degree line there. If I have n qubits, logical qubits, uh, the error rate is, goes up n times. It's much steeper. If I turn on the error correction, it turns out that the logical error rate scales like this. It's much lower, and then it shoots up and it reaches a, uh, it shoots up with a power law which is related to the depth of the code, the number of errors on, in the physical qubits that this code can correct. And uh, as long as the physical error rate, if you lower it down enough, you get below this so-called break-even point where the logical qubit has a longer lifetime, a lower error rate than the single physical qubit. And uh, that's called the uh, fault tolerance threshold. And the quantum error correction gain is how much lower the error rate is from not using any encoding at all, but just using a single qubit. And the message is, because this is a, a power here, the smaller you can make the physical error rate, the bigger the ratio you get, the bigger enhancement of the lifetime. So everybody is struggling to move down into this left-hand corner. Unfortunately, all previous attempts to overcome this factor of n and reach the break-even point have failed. Uh, and the reason is that the Maxwell demon has to decide, let's say, which of the nine qubits has an error and which of the three possible discrete errors that you measure have occurred. That's 27 different error states. And the Maxwell demon makes mistakes. So this is extremely challenging. So we try, we've now tried a different idea, which succeeded, which is not to use any material object as the quantum bits, but to use the excitations of an electromagnetic oscillator, of photons bouncing between uh, uh, inside a box with a shiny aluminum mirrors on each side, and use these microwave photon states to hold the quantum information. And so uh, uh, three qubits can be in uh, eight states, zero through binary seven. It turns out that photons in a box, you can add any number. You can have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way up. So you can, without adding more hardware, you can just increase the size of your accessible states by just using more of the levels. And so that hardware efficiency helps a lot. There's much less friction inside this, uh, this superconducting resonator. And through these superconducting uh, uh, circuit QED techniques, we can measure, control, and manipulate the states of these individual photons to do um, error correction. So uh, I think I will, uh, since it's getting late, uh, maybe just flash a pretty picture that shows you that we can uh, start with zero photons in the cavity and get exactly six at the end and take a pretty picture of the quantum state. I'll skip all the details. Apologies uh, for people that wanted to hear them. And uh, the way that you gain on error correction is there's only one error that you can, f uh, there's friction and you could f lose a photon and go from five to four, four to three, two to one. And there aren't, nine different places, there's just this one mode. So there's only one error. And by making a very clever uh, encoding, so zero logical is a superposition of zero photons and four photons, and one logical is two photons. Notice that they only even numbers there. If I can measure the photon number parity, whether it's even or odd, without measuring the photon number, then I can tell whether an error occurred. And that's a, a magic trick that we have that isn't available in ordinary quantum optics because we have these very large atoms.
So uh, this particular code, uh, an experiment, a uh, former postdoc in our group now in Tsinghua, came very, very close to reaching the break-even point. And uh, earlier in the uh, Devere, in the Shokoff lab at Yale, uh, they built this uh, air correction engine, which uh, which actually reached the break-even point, uh, went over at about 10%. And because it heralded its own errors, if you, in the few percent of the case where there was an error, you threw out that uh, data, uh, you got an enhancement of a factor of 1.75. So that's the first time in any technology that you actually reach this break-even point. Of course, 10% better is not very useful. We need to be 100 times better. And uh, that is the goal of the... Uh, uh, the big grand challenge in the field, and uh, the computer has timed out or something telling me I am done, so I will stop. <laughs>